didn't really perform to do themselves justice. Well, Swansea supporters, who are renowned for their readiness to applaud good play by the visitors, would have been mesmerised by Liverpool's magic. Their teamwork was devastating. It's simple, it's based on unselfish running, and the ability of the players to see and find each other at the drop of a hat. They've got a reservoir of talent and quick thinking at their disposal. We just examine the way they get a couple of their goals. The ball spread to the right from Lawrence in there, but look how Phil Neal, when he needs to, toe pokes off a first time pass to the waiting player again, creating the space and the time for Kennedy on the other side of the field. It's a delightful floated chip that he whips up here, but once again, a first time pass. It's a chest pass and it's a first time shot, helped in with the aid of a deflection. One of the goals. This one originated from a corner and they don't lose the ball uh, from that position. Dalgleish was the man who took the corner. Number 10 there, Hodgson, does the dummy, quick thinking, because Dalgleish is still spare. Nobody bothered to pick him up from the moment that he took the kick. And of course, it looks the simplest thing in the world for Ian Rush there to finish it off. Simplicity itself. But just let's look at another feature of Liverpool and the most important one. There are no stars, they all work for each other, not only when they have the ball, but when they don't have it. Ian Rush shapes up to hit this volley really well and on target and could be excused standing there to admire it for a moment. But as Davis shapes up to throw the ball to the vacant spot there, you can see that Rush hasn't stopped. Liverpool haven't got the ball, he wants it to create yet another chance with that perfect chip. Well, that's the standard the rest have to be to upset Bob Paisley's last season. And whoever succeeds Bob will inherit a powerful squad with plenty of life in them yet, which will include their £900,000 buy from Brighton, Mark Lawrenson, who seems now to be part of the furniture at Anfield. I think, you know, the way we played, um, and we passed the ball to red shirts, and uh, we made it very, very difficult for Swansea to get the ball. And uh, I think all the time you're doing that, you're pulling people out of position and creating chances. And uh, we scored three goals and won three now. But if the secret is so simple, or if there is no secret, why do Liverpool keep winning year after year when other teams can't seem to master it? Um, I don't really think there is a secret. Uh, you know, I think if you don't give the ball away, um, you don't allow other teams to play. And also if you close other teams down, you know, you deny them space. And I think the thing with Liverpool is that they've always seemed to have bought sort of good players and not too many untried players and players they know who can play in the first division and play to their style. You're playing in a position where obviously there's lots of competition. Alan Hansen currently out the side, obviously. I mean, how much does that really keep top players on their toes? I think that's probably, if there is going to be a secret, that may be it at Liverpool. The fact that, you know, you could probably call upon 16, 17 players who would do the business for them in the team. And so you're going to have five or six out every week. So you know you've got to play well in order to keep your place. One thing I noticed is that even senior players who have been around a long time, like Kenny Dalgleish, their appetite for doing the basics in the game still seems to be totally unaffected. Yeah, I think that's right. I think if you, you came down and saw us training, it, it's the same way. Um, it's very competitive. You know, we play it in training the same way as we play on a Saturday or, or on a weekday. You know, we want to keep the ball and want to keep the opposition out and, you know, score goals all the time. How much is said in the week at Anfield about tactics and the way that you play? Very, very little. Um, really, the boss just gives us our heads and lets us go out and play. It's as simple as that. He believes he's probably got, you know, a squad of the best players in uh, England. And uh, he just lets us go out and play and dictate the way we're going to play ourselves. And in a word, is, is possession the key to it? Yes, I would say. So if you don't give the ball away, you're always going to have a chance, I would say. Well, Bobby Robson's first selection as New England manager is expected within the next hour. And the choice of captain will be interesting. The favourites for the job being Ray Wilkins and his Manchester United colleague Brian Robson. I have a feeling it could be Robson. That's just one of the problems the England manager has had to face in his new job. Phil Thompson of Liverpool and Manchester United, Steve Coppel, were both injured yesterday, remember? But apart from Alvin Martin of West Ham, there will be no other additions to the squad. So just how much of a headache has Bobby Robson found it? It's something that I've got to soldier along with. I mean, I knew the, the problems and the hassles of the job and the irritations. These are they. Uh, Ron Greenwood warned me about them. I mean, I think in, 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 in this particular case, while I'm sorry to lose Coppola and, and Thompson, um, I've been a bit fortunate. There have been many times in the past that I understand from Ron Greenwood where he's uh, had to sit back and add to 12 players, um, you know, where he's, where he's had a deletion of about six to seven players from the squad. 
But at the same time, I do think that we risk our best players to domestic football on a Saturday prior to league football, and that isn't good for English international football and the success of English international football. And the full England side is not the only one affected by injury. The two under-21 squads have lost six players. Denmark have their problems as well, mind you, and will be without their two best players, Alan Siemensen of Barcelona and Frank Arneson of Valencia. Wales manager Mike England has fewest worries. He told me that so far there's a clean bill of health for Wednesday's game against Norway at Swansea. Owen Hand's Republic of Ireland squad has lost several players for their game in Holland. Ronnie Whelan of Liverpool, Kevin Moran and his Manchester United teammate Ashley Grimes. Plus Fulham keeper Jerry Payton who needed 23 stitches in the head after being challenged by Middlesbrough's David Shearer during yesterday's 4-1 away win. That challenge drew a sharp rebuke from Fulham manager Malcolm McDonald, who told us today, some injuries are unavoidable, this one was totally unnecessary. What happened must be on the conscience of the Middlesbrough player. Borough boss uh, Bobby Murdoch is one of two managers who are having to face up to the usual rumours of discontent after a bad start to the season. The other is Bobby Ferguson of Ipswich, who are currently bottom of the first division. But club captain Mick Mills says this of the Ipswich start, the team has played better this season than in the last four months of Bobby Robson's era. People should refrain from blaming Bobby Ferguson, who's had a good response from the players, and they should realise Ipswich's bad results started last February. Interesting news concerning Scottish international football. Scottish players with English clubs could be ruled out of international football if their clubs demand cash for their release. The Scottish FA will refuse to pay a similar fee to the £750 which top English clubs are to get from the English FA for each player released for international duty. The decision could jeopardise the careers of players like Graham Souness, Kenny Dalgleish, Alan Hansen and a host of others. Scottish FA Secretary Ernie Walker said we have no intention of playing international matches at Hampden for the benefit of English clubs. If they're not prepared to release their players, we would have 11 home-based Scots in the team. Two afternoon results in the fourth division today, Northampton 7, Bristol City 1 and Scunthorpe 0, York City 0. The North American soccer season came to an end last night with New York Cosmos regaining the title of champions. Cosmos beat Seattle Sounders 1-0 and Giorgio Canalia got the winner. Finally, after the opening three games in Scotland's Premier Division, only one side has a 100% record and that's reigning champion Celtic. Yesterday they faced what, on paper at least, looked a hard game away to Motherwell. But inspired by Charlie... ...about our national game. Good afternoon. No better form of entertainment than football when it's played properly. And I feel sure that if everybody, um, and it looks as if the majority of people are, are at least getting the fingers out a little bit, realises that the game, is, the game is a super game played right, OK, the new little innovations may have helped it, but they don't really need new innovations. They just need players, people, managers, coaches, all to play with good attitudes. And I think, you know, I think the game will flourish. Tomorrow's seesaw, we meet Bod, and that's at 1.25 tomorrow on BBC One. Well, now we return to Headingley for the second test. Plays underway after lunch. Commentary from Jim Laker. Just about to uh, complete the uh, first over here after lunch. Richard Hadley, the bowler from the coach's low end. He's just taken the new ball. David Gower has put it away quite smartly, looking for a single to try and keep the ball in. That's as much as he'll want. So just the uh, one run so far and a wide in the over. And one ball left in this first over here after lunch. A very useful uh, 29 runs added. 30 runs in fact now by this last wicket pair. So at this moment in time, New Zealand would require 100 runs to win. Just one ball for Norman Cowes to keep out. He's defended quite valiantly so far. And brings the bat very safely down on that one. A roar of applause from the crowd. And it all becomes uh, quite frustrating for New Zealand. Always uh, 
annoying when you get the last pair hanging around like this, but David Gower on 111 has played uh, really well here this morning. Been in uh, no trouble whatsoever. And Norman Cowan's his partner there has now crept onto double figures. He's on 10. Three wickets gone down here this morning, and Cairns, who's going to share the new ball with Hadley, has taken two of them. And immediately, the uh, fielders are pushed back once again. So Dilly went for 15, Taylor and Willis ball in quick succession there to Cairns. So it is Lance Cairns to bowl now to David Gower. Short hooked away to mid wicket, but they won't bother about the run off the first ball. It's quite difficult now for David Gow to find the boundary of this field. Virtually uh, eight men protecting the boundary ropes. Just uh, go near the solitary slip. Again, the single's obviously there for the taking. But uh, Gower turns it down. They're looking for one towards the end of the over. that away looking really for the four there square on the offside and inside edge we nearly played it on Lance Cairns looking for his tenth wicket in the match nearly had it there inside edge just past the off stump seven wickets in the first innings he's taken two of the three wickets to fall today very much the star of the New Zealand team even though Ewan Chatfield has put in a a bid with five wickets in this innings. So the field in now to uh, save the single. Cairns not quite happy with it. Doesn't appear he's getting too much response from Jeff Arth. I think he wanted his third man squarer, but uh, Arth has kept him where he was. The only uh, change is that cover an extra swap places. That's a particularly good piece of running, and uh, Arth will be uh, quite annoyed that they gave the single away quite so easily as that. So 100 on now with that single. Norman Cairns just uh, once again the old ball to keep out two slips gully two short legs going to crowd him and he's caught it beautifully caught low down by Crow well it really was a fine catch went off the bat very quickly it's another wicket uh, for Lance Cairns so England finish on 252 all out and New Zealand then will require exactly 101 to win their first ever test match against England in this country. <laughs> well, the 
crowd here rising to David Gower. It really has been a brilliant innings. Came in at number three. He's undefeated at the close out of that 252 score with 112. And this morning in particular, he's really found his touch. Played some glorious shots. And that has got to be one of the most important innings he's ever played for England. Well, this is... Uh, Again, how the last wicket fell, Norman Cairns, the batsman, trying to keep this last ball of the over out. Drops the bat on it, goes away quite uh, quickly and quite low down there to Crow at short leg. And inches from the ground, a very good catch indeed, and a very vital one for New Zealand. Well, that gave Lance Cairns uh, three wickets in the innings, plus his seven, so ten in the match for Lance Cairns, the first time he's ever achieved that in a test match. And there are the uh, details of the uh, England innings today, featured of course by that uh, superb undefeated century from uh, David Gower. Dilly kept him in partnership for a nice time this morning. He went to the uh, fourth catch of the innings made by Ian Smith, the keeper, off Chatfield. And then uh, Cairns cleaning up for Taylor Willis and Cowans. And possibly the most uh, remarkable feature of this test match is the fact that Hadley has never taken a wicket.